This month, Streaming Things is brought to you by Chester Copperpot, Jillian Morgan, Aaron Layton, Ghost, Andrew Gray, Casey McCain, Crystal Trujillo, Emmy, Jeanette Murphy, Enza, Jen Robinson, John Collins, Kalisha Reeves, Kate, Kiki Newton, Stanton, and Valerie. Welcome back. My name is Chris. And I'm Steve. And this is Streaming Things, the end of our Andor coverage, which never really began. <laughs> yeah. We did episodes one through three. We intended on uh, covering the show in three episode bursts, like a like a burst rifle in Call of Duty. Ta-ta-ta. Ta-ta-ta. Or real life. I assume those are all real guns. <laughs> I don't know. Probably. Never verified yeah. if those are real guns. Who knows? Uh, I will try very hard not to slip into a terrible imitation of an English accent, but I did, in fact, watch Shaun of the Dead and Harry Potter today. So and we're talking about Andor. Lots of British accents. Yes. I don't know why I just clapped my lips. <laughs> not a good audio thing. I also... I, at the top, I want to apologize to those of you who are watching the show on YouTube, uh, just in general, for having to look at my face. But specifically, if I look bored or pained at any point today, it's because I am, in fact, the latter. Uh, I have a migraine coming upon me, and I don't want to cancel the show today. Too many of you are looking forward to this coverage of a couple of these things. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to power through. I should be okay, uh, but... If at any point Steve's talking and I look like I just could not care less, <laughs> that's not true. It's just he tr- only cares a little. I might have to <laughs> pinch the bridge of my nose to make the pain go away or something like that. Have you done the the thumb trick? Is there a thumb trick? So like the like webbing in your thumb right yes. there, there's a pressure point, And if you like pinch it, sometimes that can alleviate a headache. OK, I will sometimes. try that periodically. Um it, it, it works a little bit for me. I, some people like swear by it. I haven't really had a lot of success with it myself, but that is an option for you. You ever seen the movie major pain? Like, yes. <laughs> That's what that reminds me of when he's trying to, you know, he take the pain off of daddy. Uh, arm <laughs> and then he breaks his fingers. Um, that might work by the way, if I just caused enough pain in my hand, it would remove my attention. I can go get a hammer. <laughs> you, know, you want me to just like take a hammer to it right here, right now. We'll do it. It might work. It might work. <laughs> But a cool benefit to me is I I stopped watching Andor, not on purpose. I just got overwhelmed. I have to watch so many things for like TikTok and shit like that, uh, that I, I slowed down on Andor. I, I fell behind and I told you this, Steve, I don't think I ever mentioned it on air, but I had only seen up to episode six for the longest time because that was when my buddy Jimmy got married. I watched episode six with the, the wedding party mm-hmm. and my baby. And so I was really distracted. That's not how I watch. I'm the type of person I don't even look at my phone or anything. Or if, if somebody comes in, like my wife will sometimes be like, hey, do you know where the scissors are? And like, unless I'm watching something I've seen many times, but usually even then I'll, <laughs> I'm kind of a douchebag. I'll pause it and then answer her and like it make sure she doesn't want anything else. And then I'll press play. It sounds normal, but I don't think it is. Like, I think a lot of people would just be like, oh, I missed a few seconds. Who cares? Mm-hmm. It just drives me nuts. So it drove me nuts that I missed a good portion of the the episode, which seemed really cool. So then I got that's home. The, that's the heist episode. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's yeah, the height. That's, that's a big one. Yeah. You don't want to miss that one. So then I got home. I rewatched episode six again with my daughter. And she's so snuggly. I can't describe to you what it feels like to have her cuddling, her smooth skin against her neck, going the goo goo gaga. So I fell asleep. So I tried to watch it twice and missed it twice. Oh no. But only like the last 15 minutes, both times. So that disheartened me so much because I'm so behind on so many things. I'm like, I don't want to watch this episode a third time. This is crazy. So I called you, Steve, like, a month later, like I got, a, I got something to confess. We need to talk about Andor soon, but I'm gonna, I'm way behind. And you're like, just watch the last 15 minutes of episode six. You've seen, you know what happens. So that's what I did, and I ended up watching uh, episodes uh, seven through twelve, and then the last 15 minutes of six in 24 hours, uh, which was the other day. Yeah, what a day! What but a day! You I had. had a great day doing that. That was mm-hmm. a, a good binge, you know. Seriously. Um, Cause so. you get the end of the Aldani heist. You get the whole prison experience all in one go. And then of course the finale, that is some prime TV right there. Yeah. And my experience of this show was colored by, 
uh, because I have push notifications on for the discord. Um, even though that means I constantly get notifications on my phone, I don't want to turn them off because I contribute. I feel like personally not enough in there as it is that at least I want to know what everybody's saying. Mm -hmm. But when I tell you the amount of times I picked up my phone and started to read, you know, whatever (laughs) Mando and, you know, you know, all the different characters I love on discord. And then I saw it said hashtag and or spoilers. And I would go, "Ah!" And like <laughs> throw your phone across the room. Yeah. <laughs> I went through nine phones. I'm telling you, uh, so many people just talking about Andor in in the Discord, yeah. and I wanted to participate. But if you if you notice, I've never written in there. That's why I didn't. I wasn't caught up. You just caught up a couple of days ago. But it would just be like a snippet. I would see like you or or Jen or somebody just like, uh, oh my god, that episode, guys. Are you? I'm I'm, I'm kid. Oh, I'm crying, and I'm just mm-hmm. like, no, stop it, stop it, <laughs> stop it. Stop Talk about it. So I'm glad everybody was enjoying it so much. And it, but I was kind of getting teased. I was getting teased by the Discord the mm. whole time. Like, oh, what is going on? It's so amazing. And I would have never guessed that he gets arrested again, goes to prison. There's like a, a three episode arc with I didn't even know Andy Circus was in this show. Did you before it was released? I did not know. Yeah, like when I saw his face, I was like, what? Yeah, same. There, so. there. I did see someone before I watched the episode where Andy Serkis came comes out. Um, someone tweeted like, "Man, what a great return to Star Wars for a very specific actor." And I'm like, "Oh, who could that be? Interesting." So I was going into it thinking like a major character would return, but really it's just Andy Serkis returning as a completely different character. Or is he? <laughs> <laughs> well, did he play Snoke or something? Yeah, he was Snoke in uh, the thought. sequel trilogy. He, he, oh, what if it's Kino Loy breaks out of prison? Well, he can't swim, so he's like stuck in prison. So we're like, I know what we can do with this guy. Yeah, after another hundred Meat year puppet. bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve has a structure in mind for this episode since it's a little strange. Our typical gag, if you will, is to break everything down scene by scene after we watch it. But we obviously didn't do that with Andor. So it's always tough when we go to just talk about something in generalities like every other podcast does. It's not really our forte. So Steve has a little bit of a structure here. Yeah. Well, before we get into it too much, I got to get, I got to do this. Okay. I got to get into character. We're talking about star Wars. We're talking about rebellions. Mm -hmm. So it has to happen. I came prepared for those in the YouTube. Oh man. Ah. You look good as a space fascist. Got my little space fascist cap on. (laughs) It's the little black uh, Imperial Commando caps that they wear. What's the thing on the front there? Is that was that where a button used to go? No, that's just what they put on there. Really, a little little symbol. It's just a little button. I don't know what it really. I think it has something to do with a rank, but I don't know enough about it to understand. Rank you are. Um, I don't have the little. They do. They also have the rank pins and the little pen thing that goes into their uh, chest pocket. But I'm not nerdy enough to know what you know, how to read those ranks. So, You're, but I had to wear the hat. It's Grand Moff Steve. Grand Moff Steve. I love it. We're going to do a lot of hat based comedy this week. <laughs> Just warning you guys uh, for the rest of the episode this week. Uh, but yeah, my thoughts that we would do is first we would go over overall thoughts of the show in general. Like how do we think it succeeded? Did it fail? Uh, then we would talk about some of the major story arcs that happened in the uh, series. And then we would move on to some, you know, miscellaneous bits we want to talk about and uh, questions that we got from you the listeners. Awesome. Well, but Chris, Chris, go ahead. But, 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 I'm, not, I'm used to being the but, leader, but you're the grand moths. So now I'm freaking out. Well, you have to tell me, sir, overall, what are your thoughts on Andor? I loved it. Yeah, absolutely loved it. Uh, so this is by a mile, the best star Wars TV show that has ever existed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm, I'm a big fan of Mandalorian and season one and two. Uh, for the most part, did not like Boba Fett, um, did not watch Clone Wars, the Boba Fett, the Boba Fett, the Boba Fett. I didn't watch Clone Wars or uh, what's the other terribly Rebels. animated one? Rebels. Yeah, because <laughs> I don't like the animation. We've talked about it a lot on the show. I do oh, know the animation for Rebels is barf barf yeah <laughs> it's actually a style it's, called barf it's a really good show like the storyline of Rebels is legitimately great. So Just you say the artwork is really hard to get rebels is the one right where you've you've even sent me spreadsheets of how to watch the good episodes that's clone wars clone wars clone wars has there's there's a wild inconsistency in clone wars as to what is good and what is bad yeah 
uh, Rebels is the one that has the has meth Yoda in it. Yes. Where the way they animate Yoda looks like he's just like, hey guys, want some crack? You do. <laughs> <laughs> Stole copper? I did. <laughs> Hard uh, times I have fallen on. <laughs> <laughs> There's no copper in the swamp. You had to travel. Um, yeah. So easily the best show. I would think I have a hot take potentially. Ooh, hot take. So already I'm not respected by many of the hardcore Star Warses, um, which I'm okay with just seeing how they interact with each other online. Mm-hmm. But uh, my favorite Star Wars film, I've said this before too, is probably Rogue One. Yeah. So I went into Andor like really excited. Like if it's anything like Rogue One, right? Like I know Greg Fraser, I don't think did the director <laughs> was the director of photography on this one, but uh, you know, hopefully it'll look good. Hopefully it'll it'll have like the gritty story open up the universe it did all of that stuff exactly what i wanted it to do i mean i I would also venture to say this might be i don't know if i can say that i don't think it's my this might be one do it do it say it (sighs) say it speak your truth i don't think it's a true hot take because i think i still i I do love a good lightsaber every now and then right Mm -hmm. right yeah even though it's a weapon that makes no fucking sense what like tactically it's dumb but it's cool as shit it's very cool. It's so cool. But the whole like it, Star Wars was ruined for me or lightsabers are ruined for me when somebody pointed out years ago, like they could just turn the lightsaber off temporarily and turn it back on and stab each other like very instantly. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, yeah, they could do that. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, this is one of the be- I, I wanted to say this is the best Star Wars thing, period, ever. Yeah. I, I don't know that I could say that accurately, but it's up there, man. It's top three for me. Oh, without a doubt, definitely top three for me as well. This show is so good. It, um, it is the best Star Wars has ever been in terms of writing, in terms of acting, in tor- in terms of substance and uh-huh. nuance. Like it has no Star Wars even comes close to this show in those regards. Now, you can make the argument for spectacle, for fun, for you know, overall enjoyment. Yeah. You can, you can say like, Oh, you, I like the original trilogy better or even the prequels better. I don't know who the fuck that is, but, uh, you can make those arguments for like overall fun and spectacle. Those are the other movies with, you know, big space battles and Jedi doing flippy shit. Um, but if you really want like a grounded, really well thought out story with amazing performances, as far as the eye can see, you come to Andor for that. I do love flippy shit. Who doesn't love flippy shit? Remember, remember Darth Maul? The flippiest of flippy. flippy. Well, I don't know if he's the flippiest. Yoda when he fights Dooku. Oh, good point. That is a, that is a good point. That is a good point. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I adored this show. And again, I got to experience kind of a Benji uh, version of it. Um, so I, I, I regret not being a part of the discourse week to week, but it was, uh, I was just amazed at where the show went. I had no idea that it was going to go so, it's so different. The second half is so different than the first half. Um, oh yeah. Every bit is good. Massively different. Um, and then the, the finale had me crying and stuff. Uh, a few things that I want to point out, and this is a little in, inappropriate, but I just want to get it off my chest. If you will, like, I don't want to be burdened by this, the entire show. Share, share your trauma. I think I talked about it on episodes one through three. Uh, I am just unabashedly in love with Bix Colleen. Uh, oh. I think that's one of the most beautiful people I've ever seen in my mm-hmm. life and like the entire galaxy and put a flag there. I have a question for you. Star Wars canon wise. Okay. Uh, but I, I, so I already knew I love Bix Colleen. What's the actress's name? Uh, Adria Arjona. Yes. Is, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. That is correct. Uh, however, I found myself mentally cheating on her very quickly. Okay. With Cyril. Am I the, <laughs> <laughs> but that guy looks like Kyle McLaughlin and it freaks me out. He's so creepy. <laughs> is anyone else like ridiculously attracted to Mon Mothma? Genevieve O'Reilly is beautiful. I was like, Oh my God. I want to I'd vote for her. I, I sh- that's, that's my Senator. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like her hair is so it's not quaffed, but it's like slicked back like Draco Malfoy a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but in this like perfect shape and, and she's, she's always got so, these really trendy dresses. Yeah. She's so regal. The dresses are immaculate. I was just like, I don't know what's going on, but I feel really political right now. <laughs> I want to go, I want to knock on doors. <laughs> Just go, what's that called? Canvassing? I don't know what it is about Mon Moth, but, but I feel like I could have a beer with her. More like Mon Mommy, am I right? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> it's just like a laddie, but it's Mon Mommy. <laughs> I don't like it. Yeah. I'm tweeting that later. 
<laughs> oh no. I'm tweeting that. Oh later. no. So I wanted to get that off my chest or it was good. I was just going to be bursting with that the entire time. Uh, but yeah, a uh, huge fan. This is one of the best things they've ever done. It's a giant home run. And it's, I, I, I wonder how much of how much I love it has to do with the 12 episode runtime. Like they actually gave it because they've been doing this six episode, eight episode thing the entire time Disney plus has existed. Mm-hmm. And every show feels like, uh, anything you can think of, like, you know, Moon Knight, anyone you can name probably has like two to three great episodes and then a bunch of garbage. And it feels like it was just a rushed story um, that they should have just made a movie out of if they were going to do it that way. I'm thinking of Obi-Wan you, Kenobi. Kenobi. Yeah. Yes. That should have been a two hour movie. Somebody edited it into a movie. Did you watch that? No, I bet it's way better. Yeah, I, I've heard it's actually really good as a movie, but uh, yeah, so that's my experience with almost everything Disney Plus does. And they gave this one, for whatever reason, 12 episodes to just really breathe and really get to know these characters. And like the whole Mon Mothma storyline, mm-hmm. um, I'm surprised that was even in there. Like you don't really need it, you, but it's such a great um, thing to have there, right? Like, Yeah, this show is incredible in terms of, um, you know, it's basically the story about how the rebellion comes together because there are all these different groups that are fighting against the empire at some in some way, shape, or form. There's the partisans, there's Saw Guerrero's group, there's like the Human Centric League or whatever they're called. Mm-hmm. I think Saw Guerrero like names like 10 he of does, them. Saul, yeah, he, he shits on all of them. Because he's an anarchist, right? He's an ox! <laughs> <laughs> I love Forrest. Drink, he's an ox! Forrest Whitaker's so, so good. <laughs> but, um, so, but this show is really good about not only kind of, they think of everything, right? Like if you are really going to start a rebellion and stand up to a f- fascistic empirical order, what does that mean? How do you do that in, in the face of such insurmountable odds? And while they're doing that, they're sharing really, really human stories at a macro level of regular people living in the universe, right? You know, how does someone go from like a Cassian Andor who's just, you know, he's kind of swindling people for money. He's just trying to get by. He's stealing parts. He's looking for a sister. How do you get from that to a guy who's willing to die to help just his neighbors, you know? And then you've got all these other stories like Mon Mothma, who's in the cause, you know, how does she get around funding a rebellion despite being a major pol- um, public figure? Um, you get to Luthen, who is like, how do you create and unite these factions um, without, you know, selling yourself away, but also kind of prodding the empire into making mistakes to fuel more rebellion. You know, it's just really well thought out and it allows you to really sit in the world and kind of take in what's happening. Like I love one of my favorite things about this show is the fact that you get to learn a lot of customs about and co- about cultures in the world. Like there's the whole Aldani plot and the people of Aldani, they, they have this, you know, spiritual that star system thing. Yeah. The eye, they go to the mountain, but you can hear how the empire has slowly been trying to do a cultural genocide with these people where they're kind of slowly, but surely just doing a genocide. They're just doing a cultural what are you genocide. Doing today? A genocide. Yeah. You know, just a good old down home family cultural genocide. <laughs> Uh, but then you also get to see, you know, the cultural funeral rites of Ferrix, you know, all that, you know, the brick planet. Well, guess what? All those bricks are people. I know the bricks are people, which is a great metaphor because a lot of the, someone said like, Hey, uh, uh, uh someone on Twitter said Andor is great because it showed that the, the greatest power, the, the greatest weapon in star Wars isn't a lightsaber. It's a brick. <laughs> and I'm like, no, the metaphor is literally be the brick, mm-hmm. <laughs> throw it and be it. I'm, I'm bricked. Wait, uh, I don't know. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I can't say enough for just how incredibly well done. And, and, and if I can, if I can jump on a little bit of a soapbox, just in the time. Well, it's not much of a soapboxes are typically about a foot high. I mean, you really just step up there. Steve. Well, let me just, eh, there we go. I'm right. I'm up. I'm up. I'm up. Um, in the times we live in, uh, it's, it, it, it's a little worrisome. I know at least I worry a little bit about some of the fascist tendencies that are in our current world and political world and climate. So I love it. Like how this show kind of speaks to that in a way where it's like, yeah, fuck these guys. Like, <laughs> Let's get a brick. Let's eat the rich. Come on. Let's do it. Everybody who's with me. It's always unfortunate that I I don't know if those folks would even watch this show. And if they did, I don't think they would get it. You know what I mean? Well, it's the same people who are like, wait a minute, Homelander's the bad guy. Right. Or not even that. Like I think you were talking about some people online that were, uh, you know, complaining about how Disney, a beloved children's company would come out with 
oh, they're just killing people now. The good guys are just killing people. And well, great moral story, Disney having right. the good guys murder innocent stormtroopers. Like, that's the whole point. That's why this is such an interesting Star Wars thing. I think Cassian Andor can be related. You know, he's a lot like a Han Solo character, like the swashbuckling. But instead of being just so cute and charismatic, like they really leaned into what that kind of character's day to day would be like. And yeah, he's mm-hmm. killed some people and like he's made some very questionable or outright um, dishonorable moral choices. Um, and that's what makes him so interesting. That's what how he learns and how he grows like real people do. Right. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. is what makes such a good story. Like, I think Han Solo in the early Star Wars was almost there. And then Lucas almost kind of uh, retroactively made him more of a cartoonish good guy character, right? Yeah. Like originally the Han shot first. Yeah, he thing. did yeah. shoot Greedo first. Yeah, didn't hesitate. Just shot him. That was the move. He's about survival, right? Yeah. And then retroactively, he was like, well, he moved to the side. He's a pretty good dude. You know, malarkey or whatever. <laughs> McClunky. That's right. McClunky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's Joe Biden sitting there. Oh, Joe what? Biden played by Greedo. Malarkey. <laughs> <laughs> malarkey um have you heard of dark brandon <laughs> <laughs> so you know i i love those aspects of this show um like they had like torture and stuff in this show and yeah. uh and like a really effective torture uh but the main cool thing that star wars has needed for so long is like it's it's like oh we they always say this is the flag i planted i'm sorry i'm trying to so many thoughts competing at once Star Wars confuses me because they always say galaxy, right? It's in a galaxy far, far away. Mm-hmm. Rule the galaxy. The galaxy, the galaxy. How many planets can be in one fucking galaxy, though? A lot, I guess. Oh, a lot. Like, ours has nine, so I'm just not used to that, I guess. No, our solar system has nine. We are just oh, one solar system. In the galaxy. In the galaxy, yeah. Wow, you're right. I'm so, a dummy. So, like, the first three episodes, they're they're in the uh, Priox Morlana sector. That's, like, the Priox Morlana solar system. So there's Ferrix and then that other planet where the security forces are. Yeah. That's in one solar system. Galaxy bigger than solar system, then universe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See, that was my space dumbness coming out. <laughs> I always confuse me. My space blindness. Like we got nine got in my galaxy. <laughs> well, that's the cool thing about this show is it finally opens up Star Wars because in all the other shit, we get all these movies, all these shows, this whole galaxy to work with. And we've only ever gotten Tatooine, Coruscant, and the Skywalker family, you know, yeah. <laughs> and it becomes frustrating as a, I wouldn't say casual fan, but, you know, someone who wants yeah. to be a hardcore fan. I'm just like, come on, man. No, it's, it's a, it's a galaxy literally just rife for all kinds of storytelling. And as somebody who's like been super into the books that are no longer canon anymore, but I've been in, I've read star Wars books my whole life. I, I, so I've seen all what these can be different, done. I, yeah, I've seen what can be done. You just have to, you know, trust that, you know, there's a good story and, and do it. And, and luckily, um, uh, Tony Gilroy, who is the showrunner creator and, I don't, he, he wrote most he of them, wrote if not at least all of five them. episodes yeah. at least. Um, you know, he clearly has a good vision. And uh, I think Diego Luna also has a pretty good, you know, he's, he's kind of been a little bit more in the creative input on things. Uh, I know they're definitely going to this. They wrote this first season with a second season in mind. So the show would only last two seasons. Yeah. Well, they wanted more. But as my understanding is that Diego Luna said no. Yeah. Diego says, I can't do, I can't do more than 24 episodes of a Star Wars. I don't want to be stuck in a Star Wars forever. And you know, I get it. I I want to address uh, something up front too, that I've heard a lot of people like "Eh, mostly trolls. Right. Um, But to finish my thought, we got more planets in this than I think anything else, as far as like unknown, previously unknown planets. Uh, We got Ferrix, Aldani, Niamos, Narkina five, and Segra Milo, I think are all different places that we go to. Mm -hmm. And this show, Uh, like the beach planet. Oh yeah. I love the, the we got a beach. I don't Have we ever seen an ocean before. I I, I love Myrtle beach as a planet. (laughs) Just a sad tourist trap planet destination. Like it didn't look fun. So it's definitely like a Myrtle beach, not like a California. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Anyway, but uh, a lot of people have said, and I hate this criticism about any prequel. It's like, what? It's not even interesting because you know what's going to happen. Like, it's not oh even God. interesting because you know what's going to happen. I'm like, have you ever watched any historical movie ever? Like, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, you go, oh, Gladiator's out. You know what I mean? Like, have you watched any movie ever? Like, 99% <laughs> of movies, like, oh, I bet the good guy wins. <laughs> well, oh, shit, they did. Right. It's like, that, that has nothing to The fact that we know, I, I can't wait to watch Rogue One again. With, with all this different context that I have for the mm-hmm. character uh, of Andor. Literally the only thing you know about this show and what's going to happen 
is that spoilers for rogue one spoilers for rogue one is that spoiler alert he dies in rogue one you don't know anything else about that character other than that he was in rogue one and died in it yeah (laughs) and he's morally gray at the beginning of rogue one this will be crazy because now we have like the longest like if we want to redo timeline order you what will you start with the prequels and then you would go Andor, then you would go rogue one and then you would go four five and six right Pretty much, yeah, basically. That'd be a hell of a watch. There's a Kenobi in there somewhere. Nah, is there? <laughs> I'll just watch that YouTube cut or whatever of the movie version. Yeah. <laughs> really hated Kenobi so much. Um, but yeah, I don't know. What's the next thing on the agenda here? Well, I just kind of wanted to touch on some of the major story arcs because uh, originally our initial plan was to kind of cover every three episodes, which was kind of like retroactively a good idea that we didn't capitalize on because this show is almost broken up into like mini trilogies. Yeah. It was like a great idea. Yeah. Every three episodes was like a good story arc ended. So the, so we, we covered the first three episodes, which was kind of like um, the security forces trying to go after Andor cause he killed those two uh, guys uh, at the, at the titty bar. Yeah. The downfall of <laughs> and, and, and sanity of C- Cyril Karn, right? That's his name. Yeah. And the, you know, what puts Andor in the pickle to be coming up with somebody like Luthen. Yeah. So, and Luthen saves him and he's, he's off to possibly join the rebellion. That's how it kind of ends. Well, then we get the Aldani heist arc, which is basically Luthen puts him, uh, connected with a rebel cell on Aldani led by, uh, Vel and, um, together they're planning on breaking into and stealing the monthly payroll for this entire Imperial sector, which I love, I love that idea because rebellions need money, right? Yeah. Yeah. How does, how do you get money? Especially because they also introduced the fact that Mon Mothma can't move her money around as well. So how are they going to get money? Just fucking steal it from the, the quarterly payroll, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and it's just kind of, and heists are always fun. Heists in Star Wars. Let's do it. And on top of that, like I said, you get this really cool kind of cultural look into the, the people of Aldani and how the empire is doing a cultural genocide. They, they dammed up their Holy river. They're trying to get them to stop participating. Yeah, you in their get holy to see acts. the effects of, um, you know, the empire on, all cultures, like small, small things you wouldn't think about. Like, this is why it's being, this is why people are so upset, right? You see it later with those weird, like, um, not weird, but they're just aliens, obviously really alien looking aliens. After they bust out of prison, you run into those to like, Oh yeah. They're like fishermen. Uh, they're taking all the water, all the squigglies, all the squigglies, (laughs) but yeah, it affects them too. Um, but anyway, yeah, you get to see the effect that this has on on the entire galaxy. Yeah. And you got the one guy who's sort of in charge of the empire. Who's like, they really like smells here. And he's like, they're holding, (laughs) he's like holding that like fur, uh, coat or whatever it was. That's like ceremonial and obviously very important to the people. But this guy's like, let's get on with it. I hate this bullshit. Right. Just totally not respecting the people that they're lording over. Yeah. Respecting other cultures and casting gets a pure in- colonizer mentality. Oh, hundred percent. Can casting gets to be introduced to a couple of the, of the fellow rebels with there. We meet Cinta, we meet Skeen, we meet, um, uh, Nimic? Nimic, yeah. Who's the manifesto guy. He's the true believer in the cause. He's the beginning of the whole rebellion. Really? He really is. They use that as the, that's their recruiting tool now. Yeah. Um, and, and you get to see like just how, you know, Andor's not quite there. He's still like, I just want to get paid and I want to get out. I'm about surviving. It's dumb to band together. Yeah. He doesn't think he has no love for the empire, but he doesn't think there's anything he can do about it. Yeah. Right. He just doesn't want to get caught up in that, which, you know, I can understand. It turns out Skeen. Same way. Yeah. He's just in it for skiing. I want to ask you, having watched that episode three times, <laughs> but the end where, what he, what happens with skiing only once. Um, and I'm glad I did re- go revisit it because it's, even though I knew what went down, it wasn't the way I imagined. He didn't really need to kill skiing, which I love. Like I said, mm-hmm. like that's the moral ambiguity of the, of the, of the character. Like there was, wasn't really anything too for threatening about that. Like he could have just been like, no, I don't think we should do that. And then all three of them live, right? I guess there's a, there's a possibility that Skeen was going to kill him or fuck them both over later. Well, I think what his whole thing is that of the whole three episodes, he's like really, no one trusts him because he's been this late addition to the team and everyone's so paranoid about being caught and then come to find out this guy's been planning to fuck over everyone from the start. And he's like, you're just like me. And Andor knows like, I cannot trust this guy, period. So he's just, that's what I mean. Get him off the board. In a, in a lesser movie or not lesser, but like in a more childish movie, you, you can't have the main character do that. You, they can't 
kill anybody until mm-hmm. there's a hundred percent no other way, right? Yeah. If at all, but there's a hundred percent no other choice. Then yeah, dude was still talking to him and he just drew his mid conversation. I get it, yeah. but at the same time, that's not something a, a hero would normally do because there was still. 40% chance you could work this out, you know, <laughs> but Andor cannot live with 60% chance of danger. Mm-mm. That's you're done. I, just, uh, I, I, just, I loved it. Andor has trust is- issues. Yeah, you know? I get it. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> and then he comes in, puts his gun on, on Vel and doc. And he's like, look, I just want my money. You know, and it was yeah. very like, there was like a Tarantino ness to it that I really liked. Like I wanted the doctor to take one of those forearms and pull out a pistol and him have to go to, you know, like I told you not to move. <laughs> that come. doctor was cool. He was. I like that. He'd be a really good doctor. He's got all those different hands. That's the, the, if I had one criticism about this, this show is that I don't, I, there weren't enough aliens in it. That's the only criticism I have. It's very human. And I get why, because it's expensive to make, Aliens, well, you have the fish you know? guys and you have the doctor. That's pretty much it. It's, yeah. There, there's not a lot. Um, and you, you know what I really wanted, what I was upset about hmm. in the finale, when Ferrix is doing the um, rebellion, doing the rebellion, you do it because they're trying to do a genocide and they're trying to do a rebellion. They, they rebel. <laughs> yeah. Why are we like mean girls podcasting about Andor? <laughs> um, stop trying to make Ferrix happen. Um <laughs> <laughs> that guy that went to press down on Andor for the money that he owed Brasso or whoever it was. Oh yeah. The, the giant uh, monster. Yeah. Where he's like, I don't know. He told me to just stand here. <laughs> well, <laughs> I wanted him to show back up and like pick up a fucking stormtrooper. Like, <laughs> I was like, where's that guy? That's going to be their secret weapon. But it was just Brasso with a brick was their big muscle. Yeah. I wanted him to come back. There were like two aliens in that in that mob. Plus you got the dogs that uh junkyard guys, dogs are pretty alien. I, I love those. The, <laughs> the little ghoul dogs. I'm pipping the dog. I'm pipping the dog. I got a massive underbite. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, they make their, they, 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 they do the Aldani heist. They lose a couple of comrades. Um, I don't have their names written down, unfortunately, but they make their escape to the eye, which was a really cool set piece of, you know, flying through this, uh, brilliantly colored meteor shower and luckily uh was his name nemec yeah nemec Nemec. luckily nemec well he gets he gets squished yeah a little bit Uh, squished but but he's got his little his little analog computer that has a flight plan plan for them and he's able to kind of tell cassian where to go and they can escape the one thing i loved about this scene as a star wars nerd this is the nerdiest thing to ever like but in that scene you got to see how TIE fighter pilots got in the TIE fighters, which is something I knew, like, I'm pretty sure that's what happened, but to see it on screen where they run down the little aisle and they walk down the ladder and they open up the hatch and hop in. I was like, yeah, get in that TIE that, fighter. That is cool. Yeah. And they're like parked vertically or something though. Right. Yeah. They're like suspended from the ceiling. That's right. Yeah. Very, because not a good a, design. Those twin ion engines in, uh, was it the first season Mandalorian? Um, What's his name? Gideon Moff Gideon. He shows up in a TIE fighter, but it lands and like the wings folded. Yeah. And I remember when that happened, I was like, oh, no, that's that. I mean, neat, but that feels wrong. That's not how that there's something fundamentally unnatural about doing that. I don't like it. No, thank you. (laughs) It's like it's like seeing it like I don't know. That isn't how my toys worked. Yeah, that's not how my toys work. They, the, the wings would pop off because there was explodey action. <laughs> there was one thing. I know I'm jumping around a lot. It's, I'll blame it on the migraine. One of the coolest plane things I've ever seen in a Star Wars, which is therefore in anything ever, happened in this show. Do you know what it was? Was it the, the lightsaber guns? Yes. <laughs> in a uh, Luthen ship. Luthen's ship is awesome. Yeah. I love that thing. He like pooped out all his little, uh, what are those called? Where you throw them and you might like. It's actual weapon that like ninjas use shurikens, not a shuriken. It's like, they're like little jumping jacks, but you throw them on the ground. People step on them. Yeah. You know? But anyway, he like shoots those out of the ship's butt into the tractor beam. <laughs> and then the tie fighters come out and he has the lightsabers on the sides of the ship. And he like spins and cuts two tie fighters in half. Yeah. Was like, that was fucking cool. Luthan ship is so awesome. That dude is rich as hell. Cause you know, that ship is like the most like advanced. And you ship got to see that he's, he's about that life. You know yeah. what I mean? Like you saw a little bit of that when he busted Cassian off of Ferrix, when he had the, like the charges planted outside in advance. But other than that, you don't get to see anything, but him like hiding and planning things. But it's like, yeah, he's, he gets in the, he gets his hands dirty. He knows what to oh, do. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of Luthen, uh, how did you like his little, his uh, subplot of him kind of establishing the spy network and the rebel Alliance? And he's got like a lot of hands and a lot of pots. 
You know, he, he's working with Saul Guerrero. He's working with Krieger. He's working with, um, what's his name? The ISB spy. Uh, I have his name written down, but yeah, he's working with that guy. He's, he's, uh, Oh, Lonnie. That's his name. Lonnie. Fucking Lonnie. He's Will's dad. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, and he's working with Mon Mothma, you know, and his, he's got his, um, assistant, uh, Kayla or Clea. I thought they were calling her Leia for half the episode. I'm like, really another Leia in star Wars. It's Clea with yeah, a K. That's brave. Um, I love Stellan Skarsgård in the show. Yes, he was the perfect casting. I think uh, Luthen Rail's character casting. I think Luthen Rail's uh, character is amazing. I think it's great because like, like the scene where he has to leave his spy in the ISB. He's like, oh, I got a daughter now. Um, and plus, I'm going to tell you, Anto Krieger and the 50 men are all going to die. And he's like, well, we got to let them die. Or otherwise, they're going to know that you're, you know, some, there's a spy in our midst. It's more important. And it just goes to show you, like, you can't beat the empire without making these kinds of decisions. Right. And, mm -hmm. and like the mistrust between Saul and him, like none of the, even none of the rebellion factions even trust each other. And it's, it's just so cool to see because all you get from the original trilogy is just like, Oh, it's just this where the good guys organized network up, up, up. It's a trap. You know, that <laughs> empire is coming for you. Yeah. Loose lip sink ship. <laughs> and so they all worry who, who leads them. No one knows. They just all work together, baby. And it doesn't really make any sense. And it's really nice to see like, Oh, this was like the dirty foundation of it. You know, even yeah. the, the point where he was going to kill Andor just because he knows who he is. Right. And like, I'm more important than any one person. Mm -hmm. um, that little speech he gives to Lonnie when Lonnie's like, what, what do you sacrifice? And yes, he kind of goes into, I sacrifice, uh, love. I sacrifice a good night's sleep. My entire life. My entire life. I'm, I'm doomed to use the tools my of my enemy. Uh, and it's, it's such a powerful performance. And even I, we'll get to this, but even like at the end when, during Malva's big speech at the end, there's a couple cutaways to Luthen just kind of like, fuck, that's a good speech. Like yeah. he, he's like getting into it too. And, yeah. Uh, Cause I'm, ultimately I'm, they all are motivated by what Malva's saying. Um, uh, is it Malva or Marva? Marva. Yeah. I said Malva. It's Marva. But what Marva is saying and, uh, they lose sight of that or they get too caught up in their paranoia and schemes and, you know, but he's, he's, there's this like V for vendetta speech from Marva and he, then he's moved, you know, like, yes, I wish I was Hugo weaving <laughs> or Aunt Petunia. Gas and Ander. But I'm just, uh, scars guard. I'm just, I'm just trying to sell some Antiques. antiquities. You want to come to my Easter egg farm? Here it is. Yeah. <laughs> my Easter egg farm. Dude, uh, I, we didn't get to talk about it, but his, uh, his antiquity shop is just rife with Star Wars Easter eggs. It's kind of insane. I don't get any of them. Oh, dude. Like the first time that we went into that shop, I was like, what? what's that? Oh my God. That's that. Th that's that thing. And that's that thing. And that's that thing. Deep cut. You were just Leonardo DiCaprio and all over that place. Just constantly. And every time they went back, I found even more shit in the background. It was so cool. There were Sith holocrons in there. There was like, uh, twilight, uh, twilight family headdresses back from there. twilight. No, not twilight. It did sparkle though. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much. Um, Oh, uh, so let's talk about, uh, speak of the ISB Daedra. What do you think about Daedra? Uh, I, her character is, uh, it's, it's good. It's cool. She's very capable. In the beginning, you see her investigating things and that guy kind of shuts her down when he snitches like, uh, Ferrix is mind plan. She has no right to be looking into that. Um, and, and, and it, I guess her character's purpose for me, it's like, it goes to show there's a lot of, uh, arrogance and incompetence in the empire that, that the rebellion's using to exploit. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there's, there's people like, like her every bit as intelligent and capable as Luthen, but on the empire side. Uh, and that's where you get the actual, the competition, you know, the, for every, um, there's, there's a Tarkin. There's a, there's a lot of what the fuck is, uh, Donald Gleason's Donald, Oh, um, cause he's a douche. Yeah. Well, <laughs> oh God. What is his name? I am the spy. <laughs> there's a lot of him in the, in the show, right? Hux? Hux. General Hux? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of huxes out there that leave a lot of weaknesses to be exploited in the empire, but there's a lot of mirrors too, you know? And, uh, mm -hmm. I thought her character was really cool. Now it's, it's Cyril Karn that I find so interesting. Cyril who eats nothing but cereal, by the way. <laughs> yes. Um, his mommy gives him good puffs. His mommy gives him Captain Crunch every morning. <laughs> um, 
his character is an interesting choice. I don't understand the point, but I like it. Mm-hmm. And, and season two is going to be a, like their creepy partnership, I guess. Yeah. Cause she's like, oh, I guess I will yeah, thank you at the end there. But um, like the whole fact that he's obsessed with her and she's like, get away from me. There's a really chilling scene uh, where uh, like what I love with Dedra. Cause like, she's this domineering, domineering figure, right? Very um, intense. Everybody. She's so intense. Everybody fears her, but she's also, I just thought it was a unique, like she's still a woman. Right. Uh, and so she uh, can be made to feel unsafe as any woman can, right? Because men suck. Yeah. And so there's this moment where she happens to be by herself and she's used to being in charge and everybody fearing her. And he pops up out of nowhere and he's followed her across, I assume, planets. And she's like, what she's the really fuck? unnerved. Why are you it? at my work? It's fucking weird. And she becomes like a uh, just a human, you know, like that whole domineering presence fades away. And she you can tell she's like genuinely horrified. Like, what the fuck, dude? Yeah. Uh, and she's sh- shaken when she gets back to her office and like scenes like that. I'm like, why is this in a Star War? This is too good to be a Star <laughs> um, like there's so much nuance here is what I should say, I guess, like yeah. of humanity that um, I d- just didn't expect. And it's incredible because there are villains in the show, quote unquote, bad guys. But the show goes really out of their way to humanize them. Like like Cyril's a good example where Cyril's whole motivation is is like he was working a security job. Two dudes that he worked with gets murdered and he's just kind of like flummoxed as to why no one is taking a murder seriously. He's like, isn't that our job? Aren't we supposed to stop criminals? And in his mind, Cassie Andor murdered those guys and he that's that's his driving force. And then just trying to follow the laws and the world that he believes in, he gets just kind of discarded by that whole world. But he's so desperate to get back in there and prove his loyalty. Um, and he becomes obsessed with Daedra because she is sort of like the shining example of what he wants to be. She's yeah. just as dogged as he she's is. She's not putting up with this shit. She doesn't put up with that shit, but she's successful and he admires her for that so much to the point of where it's an unhealthy uh, obsession. Well, I also like his character specifically and especially in conjunction with her because it it goes to show you like this is what this is the kind of person that is so doggedly supportive of fascist regimes and like these movements of, of, of hate and prejudice. Right. Because it's like the, the quintessential incel, like his mommy's been mean <laughs> to him his whole life, put so much pressure on him and like all he eats all these, all he eats is soggy cereal. And he just wants to, this is all he's got, right. They, he has no hobbies, no friends, uh, certainly no love interest, no, you know, boyfriend or, or girlfriend he's or anything. Got mosque. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Hello, sir. Yeah. Hello, sir. I'll do anything for you. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, you know what I mean, though? Like, it's interesting what they did. It's it's an indictment, I think. Like you said, it's it's prescient for our times, Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately. The the other thing that's very prescient for our times in regards to uh, Daedra, and you touched on it a little bit, is she is incredibly competent, right? She is incredibly smart. She's just as good as Luthen. But because she's boxed in this fascistic regime that kind of puts more focus on ego rather than facts, right? There's literally a scene like the whole time she's like, we got to capture these rebels and interrogate them so that we can learn more about their network, who these people are, and we can root them out that way. And so she wants the Empire to capture Krieger to, to find out who Axis is or who Luthen is. And there's that scene where she talks to um, director Kyburn, part of Gaz, uh, played He's by great. Anton Lesser. Um, and she's like, why didn't we take him hostage? And she's like, well, this is this is because the, Empo- the Emperor wants to get the taste of Aldani out of his mouth. So we just wanted yep. to... Just a ha ha fear, fear us. We're bad. Ha ha. So he wanted to show a victory to his boss, right? Yeah. And it, it, and it goes to, it highlights the bureaucracy of it. Yeah. And we, you know, we have suffered uh, a couple years of someone who, ha- who, who is at the top of a government who has a really frail ego and dumb people doing dumb shit just to placate an ego. Right. And so it's a very <laughs> prescient storyline. And I, and I really got a lot out of that because you see someone as capable as her meeting these roadblocks just because of a few male egos goes that can't even fathom like oh you know the the rebels can hurt us Puh, no kill them and they'll never touch us right and they're just making things worse th- for themselves uh in spite of themselves um but let's continue to um yeah let's touch on bix's torture you love bix yes i love bix what did you think about how they kind of capture her and torture her um i was terrible to watch mm-hmm. uh the is an interesting very interesting the, uh, the, the some kind of, I guess, ex, you know, genocided culture, extinct culture uh, that some kind of alien species who's like 
dying screams is some kind of defense mechanism that causes insanity or whatever. Right. Yeah. And they've captured that and messed with it a little bit and used it as, and, and then the fact that they say it's actually children when they turn hers on, um, you know, and she's such a caring person throughout the show that you just immediately like, Oh no. Yeah. Um, very creative idea, very diabolical. And, and I thought her performance was great. And like, she was completely broken by that. Like even when he first comes to rescue her, you know, it broke my heart when she mm-hmm. was like, uh, no, they're going to get angry. I'm just going to stay here. You know, it's not worth it. Right. Like that's how you, people's spirits get broken by these things. Um, metaphorically. And then literally in this torture case, um, I thought it was really effective, really well done. hundred percent. Um, and then let's touch on Mon Mothma, her story a bit. Let's do, uh, it's, Oh, it's, you know how we love in like Game of Thrones, we love like a good garden politicking. Yes. Hers was all that. Yeah. That's a hundred percent Mon Mothma all the time. She's, she's either doing like secret garden politicking in the back of Luthen's shop, in her car, in her living she room. She knows that the, the driver is a spy for the ISB. So she's using that at certain, like the whole epiphany she has at one point to, uh, staged the argument with her husband, Perrin about his gambling to cover the transactions on the bank. Right. Her husband sucks. That was brilliant. Yeah, that was brilliant. But I didn't understand that because it seemed like a solution to her problem to not have to like sell her daughter basically. And then she did it anyway. Um, but they well, also made a point of showing that her daughter was like really supportive of that anyway. Cause she's like obsessed with Sen- Chandrillan heritage or whatever. Yeah. And, and, and we learn a lot more about Chandrillan culture because I guess Chandrilla has, arranged marriage is still right. Um, and, and that's an interesting thing to talk about in a star Wars. And especially when you think of like, Oh, Mon Mothma, the character that's always been like the, one of the leaders of the rebellion. Yeah. Oh, she comes from a, an arranged marriage. That's new. Never knew that. Oh, her husband sucks. Holy shit. What's this about? Oh, her, her daughter hates her. That's sad. She's got a sister named Vel who's in the rebellion. I didn't know that. It, you, we just learned so much. Yeah, it was about so this interesting character. when I, they, we found out that Vel was her sister. Yeah. Was it her sister or cousin? Now that I'm thinking about it, it might be cousin. Mm, doesn't matter. Very doesn't close matter. family. Yeah. Well, that told us so much about her character because whatever we thought about her, uh, she doesn't have to, not that I'm a poor, right? So I'm, I'm, this is coming from experience, but like you, you think that the rebellion will be made up of more people like Cassie and Andor, right? That are like, have less choices. Like they, if they don't free themselves of this regime, then they have nothing, right? They live under the thumb of the empire. So it makes, it makes sense that, that they would fight. Whereas when you right. find out that she's wealthy, she could easily play into this system and have a great life or at least a privileged one and is choosing to live down and dirty uh, and like, you know, rob payroll banks and stuff on Aldani. It told us so much about the character of Vel. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. I thought that was a cool twist, but yeah, the whole Mon yeah. Mothma plot, like I said, in a normal Disney plus show, they would have taken all of that out and yeah. made it eight episodes. And it was honestly some of my favorite stuff. And Genevieve O'Reilly, I'm so happy for her because I don't know if listener, you may not know this, but Genevieve O'Reilly has been playing Mon Mothma for almost 20 years. Um, she originally was cast as Mon Mothma for star Wars episode three, Revenge of the Sith, and the scene that she shot was deleted. Uh, it's not in the final film, but you can watch it, where it's basically like a scene with her, Natalie Portman, um, Bail Organa, Jimmy Smith, and a couple other senators who are like, this uh, this whole Palpatine thing is kind of fucked up. <laughs> don't you guys think? Like, oh, I'm, I don't know, maybe. It, like, they're basically kind of st- talking about, like, uh, I think this government's going towards a, a bad way. Maybe we should start thinking about doing something about it. And But that scene got cut. Uh, she came back and played uh, Mon Mothma in Rogue One, uh, which, uh, if you've seen that movie. so and But this show really kind of allowed her to kind of be something. It really adds so much to the character of Mon Mothma. Yeah. And Genevieve O'Reilly is just f- crushing it constantly. Like, the 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 scene where in, um, she's talking with uh, Tay Como, her friend, and uh, what's the gangster's name? I can't, the, the, I forget. Like that whole like scene where she's like, "What are you What are you asking from me?" And he's like, "I want an arranged marriage with my son and your daughter." And yeah. Just, and just the way you can see her kind of like hating herself for doing this. Well, I love that that line where she says. He's like, well, I know it's a lot to think about as he's leaving. And, he, and she's like, I'm not thinking about it. And he's like, that's the first untrue thing you've said. And you can just tell by her face that he's, he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. Uh, in that instance and really good scene. Well, I think so to touch on what you said, she can't 
touch her money or move her money around more than she is without that guy's help regardless. Ah, uh, I know. It's, okay. So by putting the blame in front of her driver on her husband's gambling habits. That solves habits. the missing pieces, yeah, and but then, not how to get money out in And the then she can have that arranged marriage with this known criminal and the empire will be like, oh, okay, it's because she's she did that thing. It, it, it takes the whole suspicion off her. They think it's because of this gambling issue. Right. Completely, which is really smart. Yeah, that was super really smart. And really cunning, but in like a, ah, uh, like as, because you know she's a moral character and you know that she, hates doing that and that's like killing her that she has to do something like that but it's deft and the right you know if that's her goal is to create a rebellion it's that's but the, the best writing, plan for her the writers also put in this whole plot line of how obsessed with the old the ancient ways her daughter is by her own mm -hmm. choice because they have that scene where she's at the chanty dinner table or whatever <laughs> <laughs> and like her her cousin or sister you know vel's in there and she's like she just likes doing that shit i don't know it's kind of nerdy but whatever and so they put that in so that you would still you're not going to hate, like she didn't sell her daughter, right? Like you can't hate the character of Mon Mothma. You can just see the conflict there, but it's like, well, her daughter does this by choice, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. and they even made the daughter look kind of excited when she was going to meet the son. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. just a little bit of a genius ploy on the writers to not lose too much sympathy for the character of Mon Mothma. Right. Right. Well, Mon Mothma is in a prison of her mind, mm -hmm. which is a great segue to Cassie Andor's prison. Who was in an actual prison. Yeah. So uh, this was a really incredible three episode arc. Uh, what was the the planet's name for the prison? It was like this very squeaky clean prison. Super clean. That uh, was like in the shape of the Imperial logo, which I thought was interesting. Like the Empire's like, let's build prisons in the shape of our <laughs> flag. Um, yeah. uh, at, but it's like in the middle of the ocean and they have all these prisoners working on parts. I know that Niamos is the beach planet. Oh, Narkina five, I think is the Narkina five prisons. Yep. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're, they're in this, there's several layers to this prison. Each layer, there are work shifts that are working on various parts. We don't know what they are yet. Um, did you see the, the post credit scenes, Chris? Of the final episode? I did. Okay. They were building the Death Star. Yeah, they're building pieces for the Death you Star. You saw that yeah. little thing that they had made a hundred times slide into place there and the actual like laser gun part of the Death I thought that was so cool. How messed up is that? That A, they're using basically slave labor to build the Death Star, but B, like Cassian worked on the thing that kills him ultimately. Like, yeah. Oh, it's sad. And, and you... I kind of saw that coming. I kind of figured that's what they were doing. Did you see that coming at all? I didn't see that it was the Death Star. I wasn't thinking mm -hmm. about it now because there was even, it was so obvious. Like there was lines were like, oh, we don't even know what we're building, but they need a lot of these things. And it should have been so obvious, but it just didn't even occur to me. I was so wrapped up in like the Mon Mothma stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, I love the whole prison. I like a good prison break. Like that's, I love toppling regimes. You love the CBS show Prison Break. You're a big I, what's fan. funny is I've never seen that. I would have probably loved it. Everybody never likes that show. Um, I used to love a movie. Uh, it stars Christopher Lam Lambert. Lambert. Uh, do you know who that is, right? I do know Christopher yeah, Lambert. Lambert. It's called Fortress. Uh, I've not seen that. It's from 1992. It's a B movie, but it's it's a, basically this. That whole plot line with Cassian Andor in prison. It's like a super futuristic prison. Where they have implants put in their neck, like surgically or in their stomachs or something. Um, so whenever they try to break out, they just press a button and the inmate will explode. And like it's just <laughs> so it's this super impenetrable prison that you can't get out of, but it's horrible conditions. And then the whole movie, they stage this miraculous way to get the implants out of them and escape. And it reminded me of this. Cause I like, got uh, this perfect prison. Like the floors can light up and electrocute you whenever they want. Like, how would you break out of this place? It's so, um, it's so well thought out. And, and then they, over a couple episodes, like, Oh, there is a way, you know, uh, and we need the help of Andy circus. Oh, and how good is Andy circus in this role? So good. Uh, he, he's such a Great actor in general. He has a wonderful voice. And well, just, he always does all that digital stuff, which yeah. is so hard and so talented, but he never gets the credit he deserves mm -hmm. because you can't, you don't even know it's him unless you, you're a nerd like us. Yeah. And just kind of see him. So he plays a character named Kino Loy and see him cool go name. from like the, the shift supervisor who's like, all right, everybody listen to me. This is what we're doing. Keep your heads down and you'll get out of here uh, when your time's up. And then kind of seeing, watching that character realize, oh, no one's getting out of here. Um, we have to break out, he's but so he ultimately knows that he's not, he can't escape because he can't swim and there's no way out for him, but he still 
he still goes through that journey to make sure all the people that are stuck there with him can escape. I'm with that guy that got out with Andor, man. I don't think any of them made it except for those two. Oh, Melchi, is that his name? I, I think so. That but dude's or Melchi, yeah, he's in Rogue One. That's the Rogue like, One guy. Is he? Oh, is he really? He's like his buddy for life now. Yeah. So um, there's like five thousand of them. I don't know if you've ever swam across an entire ocean, Steve. Not many people. Not. Not, not many people can do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most of those guys either drowned uh, or were picked up by the Empire and murdered <laughs> or sent back to the the. The, the prison, how messed up. So that prison has like a floor. So they make everyone walk barefoot and they can like what electric you, electric yeah, you at like a whim. Such a cool idea. Um, and, and so they like, they, they ice a whole floor because some dude's time ran out and he went to be released, but instead of releasing him, they just put him on a whole new floor. And then that floor figured out what they were doing. So they just murdered everybody there to kind of keep that secret quiet. Yeah. He was, I think he got off floor four and went to two instead of another prison. They, they screwed up the bureaucracy of it. Yeah. And so all, because yeah. the death star is notoriously always behind schedule, so they can't lose, they can't lose their workforce. Mm -hmm. So just keep the prisoners in there. No one cares about people in prisons. Right. You know, and then again, pressure for modern times. Well, and that's labor. What, I, I thought it was such a good plot device because Andor's like, you know, there's nothing we can do about this. It's a giant galactic empire. What is little old me going to do? The best I can do is find a little tiny slice of happiness. Bix and my mommy, you know, some money, Bix and mommy. That's all I care about. And, uh, and so he goes to this beach planet and then he gets arrested for a completely unrelated for reason nothing. to Ferex or Aldani. And it's like, it, it teaches him. None of us are ever going to be able to be happy with the empire and power like this. Like, look at this. You're just going about your day, walking around the beach, not hurting anybody. And then you're in prison for six years. Right. Mm -hmm. And then come to find out it's infinity years um, for no fucking reason whatsoever. Just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's, I think that's what kicks it into gear slowly. That like he has to be a part of this uh, if he ever wants to be happy at all. If anybody ever wants to be happy. So I, I really like that scene on the beach because you get um, to see the K2SO droid. Yes. Which it, like you get to see it being menacing, which is that's a really menacing design. But because K2SO is such a great. Hang you. Hang. <laughs> no. no, that's not what he meant. <laughs> uh, but the, the sand trooper that gets him in trouble is actually played by Sam Witwer. Do you know who Sam Witwer is? Uh-uh. Uh, he does a lot of voices in Star Wars, but he's probably most well known for playing Star Killer in The Force Unleashed. Um, uh, but he's he also voices Darth Maul in the Clone Wars, and I think he's the new voice of Palpatine in animated things. Oh wow! Because he does, he does some a really, huge characters. He does a really good Palpatine. I think he was actually better than the original guy who passed away, who did the Palpatine voices in uh, Clone Wars. But um, uh, and, and and so this the Prison Break, um, Nemec's character. It, it starts this, this thing where a lot of the characters just yell at each other to climb, climb, climb. Cause you know, Nemec tells them to climb mm -hmm. to freedom. Uh, they're climbing to freedom out of the prison in rogue one K2SO tells them to climb right before he dies so they can get it. There's like this good pull, this really good, um, you know, it rhymes, you know, these, these elements where like these characters are always telling each other to climb, get out of the dirt, fight the empire, get up, you know? And I really like that sort of message that they're saying there. Um, but with that, let's talk about the last real bit of, uh, the show. And that is, uh, the final episode, mm. uh, the funeral episode. So the penultimate is the daughters of Ferrix. And that's when we find out that that Marva dies and she dies off like kind of off screen. Like, mm -hmm. like we don't, we see her kind of frail and ill. Um, but wow, what a cool, the last time her and uh, uh, Cassian talked to each other, she's basically like, I'm going to fight the, the empire. Like they, they killed my husband, your dad. Yeah. Um, and we found that out too, in an episode that he was basically hung in the town square for something he didn't even do. Right. Like someone threw a rock at some clone troopers. Yeah, and, he was trying to stop them. Yeah. Um, Incredible episode, man. I, I was watching it with my son and, uh, you know, they were, uh, wow. I didn't expect it to be overcome with emotion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just had this image of him pounding on that fucking, that metal rectangle, you know, and hammer I, guy, hammer guy, man, I love hammer guy. So the a thing about me, I was telling, I was telling you this on the phone when I was, when I called you when I finished it, but like, we don't talk about it a lot, but like dystopian is like my favorite genre. Um, I think probably I could say that accurately. And especially if there's like a, a regime to overthrow, you know, mm -hmm. like V for Vendetta is, is, is not, 
the best movie in the world, but I unironically love that movie. I love that movie. It is so good because I like seeing, you know, motherfuckers get overthrown, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then you got your, one your fascist baby. Your favorite guy, right? Is in that movie as well. John I, didn't, Hurt. I didn't even think about John yeah. Hurt being there. He's the evil fascist. <laughs> you would do well, Inspector, to put it out of your mind. Um, <laughs> oh my God, did John Hurt just come back? <laughs> is he here? That's a good line. But when they're, they're, you know, they, they give them the all clear to shut down Rick's road and, and they can do the funeral with 30 people. They asked for, for more. So we gave them 40. Right. And then you see thousands of people coming down the streets and you see those uh, asshole stormtroopers start freaking out and like, all right, block the road. Oh, they're not, they're, they're, they're doing bad stuff. And the, the notes of the marching band, um, I'm just really easily moved by that stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. And of course, Marvis speech was great, but ultimately I was already and just when the, the first notes of that marching band, I was yeah. in it, man. And you can see uh, Bix leaning through the window, like humming like the dirge. Mm -hmm. um, it's really powerful stuff, man. I did not expect to cry on air <laughs> thinking about it, but really powerful. Yeah, I've watched that scene maybe 10 times since it aired. It's so incredible. Just like, cause you get, we met all these side characters earlier on. We see, we see Brasso. Uh, there's, um, Oh gosh, there's so many of them. There's, there's, there's hat guy who had like, who has the dogs. I can't remember their names. There's, there's Melchie. Um, there's, oh, we forgot to mention Salmon. I think his name, Salmon Pack. He was the guy in green. He gets tortured and killed off screen. Um, when they capture Bix and his, his son, uh, woman, I think is how you pronounce that. He's building he's a bomb. Throws the bomb. He's building a bomb in the first opening minutes, <laughs> minutes of the show. That's the moment that gets me is when he turns that sucker on. And it's one of those things like, it's like, yes, you know, mm -hmm. but look at it from the empire's point of view. And that's what I love about this show. And like other, other like children of men, uh, even V for Vendetta places like that have done a really good job of showing you that like, if you're just like a citizen trying to toe the line and, and put your head in the sand, uh, moments like this that happen on Ferrix, those are acts of terrorism to you. That's what those seem like, right? Like that's what the, the people in power say on the news about what occurred on the incident of Ferrix was an act of terrorism, you know? Um, and I like that they, even though it's a Disney show and it's a star Wars thing, it went there. Like, you know, yeah, they're, they're blowing shit up. Yeah. Like the, the, the guy, there's a Ferrixian citizen, uh, on the, he's snitching. That's why he's over there, but he dies as a result Nerchie, of that explosion. That's his name, yeah. And, and it's so incredible. Cause you see all these characters, they come together for uh Marva's funeral. The empire is kind of like, Again, they're doing a similar thing with what they did to Aldan Aldani, where they're kind of chipping away at this big funeral, right? Where they're like, oh, they want to start at noon, they can start at one. Oh, they want a hundred people to show up, they can have twenty. You know, they're just trying to chip away at their culture so they 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 don't get together. But Marva is such a big part of the community that everyone just shows up anyway. And I thought it was genius that the 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 song that the band plays has been the theme song for Andor the entire time. Mm -hmm. Like that. Oh, when, when I was like, Oh, that's the theme. Holy shit. That's good. Um, and then during Marva's speech, it keeps cutting to all these minor characters that we've briefly gotten glimpse of into their lives. Right. And you can just see how it's affecting them. Like they cut to uh, uh, Wilman, the uh, the son who's, I assume dad has just been killed by the empire and he's just built a bomb. And you, um, that actor, Muhammad Bayer, I think is how you pronounce that. Just the pain and anger in that little actor's face is just heartbreaking. And when he's, oh, I, it crushes me. And uh, Brass is looking real hard. Um, it even cuts to like, like I mentioned earlier, Luthen's getting really into the speech. It cuts to Mosk at one point and you're like, Oh, is Mosk like feeling this? Like, yeah, I wonder if season two, if, you know, Cyril and Daedra are going to like become the power couple and, you know, we're going to fight the rebels, but Mosk is going to be the ones like, I don't know if I'm about this last star. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like the brick people now. Yeah. Um, Everybody's but, everybody's moved by it or at least uh, concerned. I, so I've got to read some of it. I've got to read some of it because it's so good. Like, uh, I fear for you. We've been sleeping. We've had each other and Ferrix, our work, our days. We had each other and they left us alone. We kept the trade lanes open and they left us alone. We took their money and ignored them. We kept their engines churning. And the moment they pulled away, we forgot them because we had each other. We had Ferrix, but we were sleeping. 
I've been sleeping and I've been turning away from the truth I wanted I wanted not to face. There is a wound that won't heal at the center of the a galaxy. Terrible wound. A terrible wound. There is a darkness reaching like rust into everything around us. We let it grow and now it's here. It's here and it's not visiting anymore. It wants to stay. The empire is a disease that thrives in darkness. It is never more alive than when we sleep. It's easy for the dead to tell you to fight and maybe it's true. Maybe fighting is useless. Perhaps it's too late. But I'll tell you this. If I could do it again, I'd wake up early and be fighting these bastards from the start. I love old, older actors just calling the Empire these bastards. It's my new favorite thing. When Luthen does it in episode three, I loved it. Marva comes in hot and calls him these bastards. I'm like, fuck, yes, hit that dude with a with the Marva brick. And it's so fucking good. And, uh, and if I could do it again, I'd wake up. I love that line. I'd wake up early. I show up early. I'd get my tea at 4 a.m. before I start fucking these bastards I'd, up. I'd turn my heat on in the apartment. I'd get ready. <laughs> <laughs> and then that kicks off the whole riot. And well, it's like the whole, it always goes back to I love that they put Andor in a prison too, because everybody's in a prison under the Empire, right? And so you get this metaphor. Where and then ultimately his realization is I'd rather die fighting them than to die giving them what they want. And those are the only two options we have, right? Yeah. So that's the theme of the whole show. Yeah. Um, you know, we're probably gonna die, uh, but I'd rather die fighting them than die giving them what they want. Mm-hmm. And to realize as a Star Wars fan, and when you open it up, like all of this is going on, and little Luke's fucking digging a sand hole and pooping in it somewhere, and like <laughs> You know, like the, the, and that's where I like that you get the size of the galaxy finally. And like what really, it all started with this and these like real normal people, right? You know, mm-hmm. doing what they could or no one else had a chance. Yeah. Absolutely. Fucking Yoda somewhere in the swamp. And, mm, I don't know why I, I'm here. <laughs> Probably something better I should be doing. Bored I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What did Yoda do that whole time? Dude, well, come on, man. He probably, he, oh, well, I, th- he learned how to talk to Qui Gon and become a force. Many ghost. useful things did. I could be doing, just chief in that swamp weed, making bread. I have been doing. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> just Almost like a COVID all, thing. All of our yeah, all of our pandemic plans is Yoda's been doing it on Tekka for this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Building a shed, I will. <laughs> Getting a Zoom call, I am. Mm. <laughs> uh, there was one last thing I wanted. I also wanted to read one little bit. Uh, this is part of Nemix. Uh, manifesto. I just think I love this type of shit because I'm with you, Chris. I, I love a good, you know, toppling the regime type stuff. And I, and this show has maybe four or five great, excellent speeches that kind of speak to that and get you kind of like, yeah, let's climb, baby. Stone and sky. Uh, stone and sky. Stone and st- <laughs> but uh, I really like this one because I think this one is puts it, you know, perfectly. This is from Nemex Manifesto. Uh, It says, and even the smallest act of insurrection pushes our lines forward. And then remember this, the imperial need for control is so desperate because it is so unnatural. Tyranny requires constant effort. It breaks, it leaks. Authority is brittle. Oppression is the mask of fear. Ah, so fucking good. This show has amazing writing. It does. I love it. Yeah, I'm with you. The best writing of anything Star Wars, probably. I think I can say that. As a whole, I do like me some flippy flaps and some lightsabers and stuff, right? But mm-hmm. this show, I mean, it's an incredible, incredible feat, Andor. Well, where do you think season two is going to go? If you had to make a, if you're in the predictions game, or what do you want to see in season two? I I have no idea. Oh, goodness. I think, obviously, we're going to get Andor more deeply rooted in, in the, in the, rebellion, right? Luthen was very happy to take him under his wing. We're going to see the exposure and death of Luthen, I would imagine. Probably Mira is going to find Axis. She's going to arrest Luthen. He'll have a last hurrah. Uh, he's not going to snitch on anybody, but he's going down. Um, it was Cassie Nander. Cassie Nander. Uh, probably the death of his little shopkeeper friend as well. She's going to go down with him. Ah, uh, Clea. Um, uh, let's see here. I think Mon Mothma probably gets away scot-free. Well, I'm excited. There's one event and, you know, maybe fast forward 30 seconds if you want no spoilers at all, because they hint towards this event that happens in uh, major lore regarding Mon Mothma, because the inciting reason Mon Mothma leaves the Senate and becomes a enemy of the Empire is through the Gorman massacre. And she talks about the Gorman several times throughout the show. And the massacre is, I think, if, if I remember correctly, it's these Gormans. They're protesting 
the empire showing up at their dock and like is grand moff tarkin is in a star destroyer and they won't like these protesters are like hey you can't land here and a mob of Tarkin's like, just fucking land on them. And so they just like, oh, he lands the destroyer, lands the ship, like on like thousands of people and just murders them. And she like spoke out and like blamed the emperor specifically for that. And they were like, okay, go kill her. And that's how she like became a member of the rebellion. That's how that's the inciting incident that makes her leave the Senate. And that's how she gets found out. So I wonder if they're going to show that in this wow. second season of the show is how she actually becomes the leader of the rebellion, that would not be just a covert senator. Disturbing to watch visually, you know? Yeah. It'd be just messed up. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know enough about Star Wars canon. I can just surmise that uh, the rebellion gets more rebelly. And uh, obviously we got to lead up to meeting Jen Erso or right before then, you know, so, cause they only have two seasons to do all that. So they got to get from, from B to C pretty quickly in season two, mm-hmm. but I'm really excited for it. A lot more excited for season two than I was for season one, because after Kenobi, I was like, ah, oh, fuck. Yeah. I don't know how good these things are ever going to be. Yeah. Cause we got Boba Fett and Kenobi back to back. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and Ma- Mandalorian's really good at yeah. times, but it's also kind of like it's, sticky, it's, you know, it's, it's like, Saturday oh. morning cartoons. Yeah. Yeah. You it's the, fun. The baby Yoda and the, you know, it's, yeah, it's fun time. Mm-hmm. And Luke, it looks back. Hey, baby Joey. Hey, I don't know why. hey <laughs> that's that Luke Skywalker. I, I, I love him. I love that fucking guy. That fucking Luke guy. <laughs> <laughs> and the best episode of Book of Boba Fett was the Mandalorian episode. <laughs> yeah. Let's be real. <laughs> let's be honest. I love Dandor though. Thank you all for sharing this with me and hopefully um, for being so patient. We got so many tweets and messages and DMs about, Hey, where's the Android? Co- Andor- hey, where's the Android coverage? Well, real quick, we, you want to blaze through a couple questions that people sent in? It's blaze, baby. All right. Ghost asks, do you think the lost sister plot was abandoned or meant to be a mystery? Lost sister. You know, the first three episodes where he's like looking for a sister and that's why he ends up killing those two guards. Uh, Cause he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, somebody tells him in like episode seven, stop looking for your sister. You're never going to find her. I think it's Marva when he goes back to Marva. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, maybe. So it wasn't completely abandoned, but I think we'll find out a lot more about that in season two. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely the MacGuffin to kind of kickstart the yeah. events of the story, but I think we're going to come back to it in some mm-hmm. way, shape or form. Um, and I was thinking of the lost sister episode from stranger things. And so I was <laughs> like, what are you doing here, Steve? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. This is from a I really do think old Holly email. will be back in season five. I say that every year. <laughs> uh, oh, this is a good question. What are your thoughts on the lackluster popular appeal, despite the critical acclaim? I think that people lost a lot of faith um, after Kenobi and Boba Fett. Mm hmm. I also think that as good as this show is, it's not what people want in a star war. Uh, it's just like, it's what I want in a star war. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think it's what a lot of the, the big fan base wants. They want Luke Skywalker. And it's it's like, keep bringing that motherfucker back. I don't care. You know, (laughs) like that's how they are. Right. And so, um, that's unfortunate. I also read somewhere that the, the viewership for Andor was not as low as like that guy made that graph, of, I don't know if is that what you're, did you see that where he mm-hmm. made the, the line graph of all the star Wars shows and how Andor was the lowest that went viral. Uh, and a week later he came out like, Hey, I did that wrong completely data wise. Sorry. It's, it's actually doing pretty well. And it's not at all what I made it look like. I'm so, oh. so he was actually, uh, he was, he, he had journalistic integrity to come back out and say, Oh shit, I messed up the math on that one. Or the, at least the repre- the histogram version Good of it. Good for him. Um, but anyway, so I, I guess I don't have an intelligent answer for that. Well, I think you're, I think you're right. Like there is, there is some lost um, faith because of Boca Boba Fett and Kenobi, but also, you know, and I made this joke leading up to the show, like, Oh, you know, everyone's favorite star Wars character and, or yeah, you did. Can't yeah. wait to hear about that guy. We all remember and, or our favorite from, from a movie. Yeah. Uh, and I, so I think that's also part of, or a lot of people, they were burned from Kenobi. They were burned from book of Boba Fett and maybe they just didn't have the time or energy to risk, uh, watching a show that they weren't a hundred percent confident would be good. And it's a prequel to a prequel. Mm-hmm. So, well, I, I mean, that's any Star Wars. No movie. reason to expect that it would. Yeah, <laughs> that's any Star Wars movie at this point. No reason to expect it would have been as good as it is, as it is though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. it's it's really really good. Uh, let's see, do 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 do. What other ones are good? Oh, uh, maybe we talked about this. Which scene was the saddest, and which scene had you fist bumping the air most? 
Oh, uh, the saddest. There's so many sad moments. Um, mm -hmm. The moment where you get to see Kino Loy just kind of looking at the ocean like, I can't fuck, swim. Fuck. Uh, <laughs> I can't swim. Uh, and then he gets, Andor gets pushed off. Like, not that he wasn't going to, he was definitely going to leave his friend. <laughs> uh, obviously, when Nimic gets squished, that's very sad. I get sad watching, I think it might be in episode three when he leaves uh, Ferrix and there's just that shot of uh, Marva crying. Like something about her, just that single tear rolling down her eye just really gets to me. And you could see the breath because yeah. her, her apartment's so cold. Fiona Shaw, by the way, is the actress and of Petunia. Marva. And, and she's also Aunt Petunia in Harry Potter. And it's just amazing watching because we're doing Harry Potter right now. We're getting, we're seeing Harry, uh, Aunt Petunia one day. And then you watch, you turn on this show and you're like, God damn, Aunt Petunia crushing it over here. Um, I, the only part I openly cry about is, um, is the funeral at Ferrix the, an episode. That's the only time I openly, but apparently I cried just talking about it. So that's, so that's saddest. I have, that's sad, but I was, I wasn't like sad crying then though. I was like, that's also a fist pumping I, moment. It is. It's a fist pump, but I, I'll if, just to throw in another one. Uh, I want to say Luthen's ship with the lightsaber sides. Oh, yeah, that was a yeah. fist pump moment. <laughs> yeah, Cause I'm like, cool. how's he going to get out of the tractor beam? Uh, uh, you can't get out of a tractor beam. You can't get out of a tractor beam. <laughs> um, there is one question. I like this question. Does Andor get a special name for Easter eggs? So we have Easter eggos. We have uh, dragon eggs. Is there is there a one we can do for Andor? I'm trying to think. I don't know. Uh, Luthan artifact. Easter bricks. <laughs> Easter bricks. <laughs> Bricked up. Luthan artifacts. I like that. Holocrons. A holocron. Yeah, we probably would have went holocron. Holocron. We were going to do extended coverage. Mm -hmm. Season two, baby. Maybe we'll do episode by episode uh, since it'll have an in, an input fan base already, you know? Yeah. Something we can be confident people would want to listen to. Message Disney Plus and tell them not to have that show on Wednesdays. Yeah, please, Disney <laughs> Plus. Or maybe we'll be doing this full time by then. Who knows? Two years from now. Who Hopefully. Knows? That'll be dope. Uh, Jordan esque writes in, what are your boys th uh, thinking on the development of Cyril? Uh, I thought it, I, or the Cyril arc, excuse me. I thought it was going somewhere excuse me, somewhere big. And he and Andor were two sides of the same coin, but kind of left me wanting in the last few episodes, bigger part in season two. I hope he will do more than be a Daedra sycophant slash stalker. Well, that's a great question, Casey. And I think, um, I talked about my thoughts, basically the answer to this question in the actual episode about a half hour ago, but I think it was awesome to see an incel, you know, like, a yeah. the type of person that is just like fully supportive and gung ho for this kind of regime. Taylor's um, throne outfits. But also I think there's a lot more to explore in season two. I think, I think she's right there. Yeah. I do think there's going to be a lot of him and Daedra power coupling in the next episode, yeah. the next season. But I, I think there is going to be that added wrinkle of Mosk kind of maybe, pulling him away or maybe he might have some sort of redemptive arc because he does have a lot of similarities with I think Andor. she's more redemptive than he is but but uh, yes she is but i also think he specifically has a lot more similarities to andor meaning you sure. know he, he also has a very important relationship to his mother but like the opposite side of the coin uh so i don't know i'm really fascinated to see where that trio ends up or that duo specifically, but I just want Mosk to be there. Cause I love that guy. Yeah. That little human cannonball. Give me more of him. And then last question from will will he asks, uh, who was your favorite character on the empire side? Is it Daedra? Um, interesting. Interesting. My favorite character on the empire side. I think it is Daedra. Yeah. De Daedra's a really good character. I do want to mention, uh, yeah. Uh, Kyburn, whatever that character's name, he played Kyburn in Game of Thrones. I just love how he's like, what are we doing here? Tell me, and like the way he kind of conducts meetings, like, and what do you think? And now you, he's, now you speak. He's good at his job. We're done here. And yeah. <laughs> he's so efficient. Yeah, flamboyantly efficient. That's how I would describe him. Uh, and I respect it. I respect the hell out of it. But ultimately, man, I loved Andor uh, and I can't wait for season two. Are you the same way? Oh, a hundred percent. This, I, you know, spoiler, I think this is my favorite TV show of the year. Wow. So, yeah. I loved it that yeah, much. It's very, very good. It's very, very good. Probably my number two, but I've been thinking about that a lot, but, um, we got to get going here soon. We got Shaun of the dead for the patrons and yeah. we got uh, Harry Potter chamber of secrets for the, secrets. uh, for the casuals and everyone else as well. The casuals. <laughs> <laughs> That's all the time we have for right now. Thanks for listening to our Andor Talk. My name is Chris. And I'm Steve. And this 
was streaming things. Stone and Sky. Stone and Sky. Stone and Sky. Here's all the new patrons that we got in November. New, new. New, new. In the Try Before You Deny Man uh, category, we have Emmy. Thank you, Emmy. New to Marty B's VIP section, we have Carl DiMartino and Sean Kerrigan. Oh, we know where the party happens in the VIP section. Mm -hmm. In the Chocolate Pudding Producers, we have Laura Hardwick, Adam Jett, Jane McMillan, Katie, Alexandra Cordova. Good luck. Silja Hiljet Skatshim. I am very sorry. I, that's obviously uh, it's Icelandic, maybe? Maybe. Or Norwegian, maybe? Maybe. Anyway, sorry for butchering that, but I tried really hard. I think it's ruder to not try. That's my yeah, opinion. Yeah, try before you deny. Yes, right. try before you deny. What if Silja Hiljet Skatshim is a little girl, man? <laughs> <laughs> Cheyenne Bragg, Aaron Carr, Christy Ellens, Aaron, Toby Sands, Keenan Chu, Victor Weaver, Tina Gomez, SJ Dog 21, Kaylin Swift, Sharon Linden, Josh Seidel, Zoe Schubert, Andrew Diaz, Jada Haley, Nick and Aaron B. Thank you, Nick and Aaron B. And everyone else you said. I don't know why I specifically said their name. Mm -hmm. And in the Friends Don't Lie producers, we have Megan Stolarski, April Palmore Sullivan. Thank you so much. And Friends Don't Lie. And we've got some people who upgraded what? newest to the Try Before You Deny producers is Jeanette Murphy. Hey. And and recently joining Marty's B and recently joining Marty B's VIP section is Jacob Schleer and Trisha Bueller. This section is open to all. Bueller. 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 Trisha Bueller. I'm sure I've she's never heard that joke. Never at all. No, never. There's no way in hell. She's she's, heard, no one's ever been that clever. Now she's going to hear it four times this month. At least. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to everybody. Woo! Woo!